Uh, we're, we're doing this little series that goes with this movie. I encourage you to go see the Christian movie Overcomer that was actually filmed in Columbus, Georgia. And all the cast members and crew to the movie have all been in your church. Uh, because on the, on the last day of filming, when they did the big ending scene, uh, they, had a, uh, they had rented out Kinnett Stadium at Shaw High School. And for the final scene of the final uh, marathon of the cross-country match, they, uh, they did it there. And so we fed everybody here. All the cast members and crew were all here, here at dinner. So we got to meet everybody. And so all those, uh, everybody on screen has been here and eaten in your church and prayed in your church and, uh, and had devotionals here. So that was really a cool thing for us last summer. Today's message is name in heaven, name in heaven. And so let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, that you are here to teach us. You are here to teach us and mold us and to show us that we have an overcomer inside of us. And that overcomer is the spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. And I thank you, God, today that you are here and that you are real, and that all of this depends on you. All of this depends on you and not on us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Name in heaven, or um, you can call it NIH. I had a friend when we were uh, growing up, and he always had dreams of having a Christian band. This is back in the days of the Christian bands. Not the Christian singers, but the Christian bands. We had Christian bands like, like Petra, Striper. You know, we had bands like that. And so, uh, anybody, can, anybody down with some Striper? Anybody down with some, some Petra here today? And I'm happy, Did I miss anybody's favorite Christian band? Did I miss anybody's band back in the day? But he said uh, he didn't like it that uh, people would know the names of those bands. And then, like, you, know, you try to come up with the name of your band and all those kind of things. And he didn't like it that, like, kind of the name would be the big thing. And his idea was that, like, all the music would always be free. He said the whole idea that God would give me a song to write and then I would get paid for that song when it wasn't my song to begin with. And all this thing about back, you know, Years ago, you know, you'd have like a cassette tape and then like you would copy the cassette tape to give to someone else. But you would have like the Christian blessing of sharing the cassette tape, but the Christian guilt that you just stole some music from somebody. You know, so he, uh, he, um, he was all about like, man, we're going to give all our music away and we're not going to have, we're going to give all of our music away and we're not going to have a name for the band. He said, the name of our band is going to be NIH, Name in Heaven. What's your name? I don't know. It's in heaven, NIH. And so that's where Jesus is in this process of walking through teaching his disciples. In Luke chapter 10, verse 18, um, he gives this key verse to this passage of Luke 10. He told them, I saw Satan falling from heaven like lightning. He had sent them out in a group of 72 to go into the cities to which he was about to go to. And he sent them out and he said this. He said, look, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy. He saw it in advance. He saw their success in the kingdom of God in advance. He said, and you can walk among the snakes and among the scorpions and crush them. Now, he's not talking about literal snakes or literal scorpions. He's talking about the people who are snakes, the people who are like scorpions that will sting you. And he said, and nothing will injure you. And then in verse 20, the key verse for today, it says, don't rejoice because the evil spirits obey you. Don't rejoice because the evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. A few years ago, we were praying for uh, Miss Nancy over here's father. And we were praying for her father. We knew the history there, and everybody's family has a history, right? The more you get into the family of God, the more your family history comes up, kind of comes part of the family of God's history. 
and uh, I'm connected with you, and so I'm connected with your family. Does that make sense? Like the more I know you, the more I know about your parents, and the more I'm kind of connected to your, your story and your parents' story and your grandparents' story. And so that's really a beautiful goal of the kingdom of God is that our families become the best of one another's families. And so we got to know uh, Miss Nancy's mother in the process of her um, passing away and going to be with her Savior in heaven. But then there was the story of her dad. And oh my goodness. Um, she grew up with some things and, uh, and, and knew about some things that many of us would identify with from, um, from a father or a mother or a grandfather or an uncle that was just really hard, really difficult that really made childhood something that was very painful. And so after Miss Nancy's mother passed away, then we got to know her father a lot better because all of her mother's prayers for her father began to come true after she died. And so as the years would come, Miss Nancy would come in and say, well, he seems a little softer. He seems a little nicer. He said, he said, I'm sorry one day, which is pretty rare. And um, I rode with him in the car on the way back from his wife's funeral. And he and I talked. And I got the impression this is the first conversation, in-depth conversation, with a pastor he had really ever had on that depth of a level. And... And so one day I went back to his house and I knew that he was sick. I went back to his house and I asked him if I could come. And the man who was known to be so hard and the heart to be so hardened, the man that was known to be someone who caused inflicted pain in his family, his children, his wife, the man who was known to be somebody you just don't want to try to talk to him about anything about God. I sat with him in his house in his living room, on his couch, and explained the gospel to him. And he was so ready and wholeheartedly ready to commit his life to Jesus Christ. It reminded me a lot of, uh, of those moments on the cross with Jesus with the men there beside him. And all it took was for the one man on the cross, on the right-hand side of Jesus, and then the other man on the cross, the other cross on the other side, for one of them to say, remember me, Jesus. Remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly this day you will be with me in paradise. And so that day, uh, Mr. Curtis's name was written down in heaven. And all the things that he had done that were good and all the things that he'd done that weren't so good, just like all the things that you have done that were good and all the things you've done that weren't so good, every bit of that pales in comparison to the fact that Jesus has your name and your life is covered by, the blood, by his blood. And there's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing you can do to deserve it. And there's nothing you can do to erase your name from heaven once he writes it there. As if we could erase what Jesus has written. And so when he says this to them, he's saying, I see that you had a good day. You know, <laughs> I see you had a good day. But he also knew that there would be a day coming when there wouldn't be such a good day. On that day, they obeyed him. He knew there'd be a day coming that they might not obey him. On that day, they went out in their group and they stayed with their team. But he also knew there'd be a day when one of them might wander off and be not so successful because they tried to go their own way and didn't feel like they needed the team, the church. And he knew a day that they might encounter some bigger, badder evil spirits and some much meaner people <laughs> than they'd ever encountered. 
And there'll be a day that they might have to learn some lessons about ministry that don't seem so pleasant in the moment, but are so golden as the days go by. And so the process of him sending them out looked like this. What's in a name? Verse 1 of Luke chapter 10. The Lord now chose 72. Now, I don't know why he chose 72. Uh, Some of the translations say 70. Some say 72. Uh, It's all about those original words. But the point is this. There's a change in Luke chapter 10. There's a change happening right there. Because up until this time, all of Jesus' ministry and work had been up in the northern region of, of Israel around the Sea of Galilee. If you don't know, uh, the northern region of Israel is Galilee. And then the Jordan River comes down from the mountains above the Sea of Galilee. It fills up the Sea of Galilee. Um, It's actually three rivers that come all into the Sea of Galilee. And then the Jordan River is called the Jordan that comes out of the Sea of Galilee and flows all the way down to the lowest point on earth, which is the Dead Sea. And up on the hillside above the northern end of the Dead Sea is that city, Jerusalem, the controversial, politically charged city that's always has been a city that's been fought over and changed hands and fought over and changed hands up until today. And so Jesus says, now I have to go down to Jerusalem. And what he means is, in this last of his three years of ministry, what he means is is that I've got to go down and be prepared to be sacrificed on the cross for you. Um, He's starting that process of training them to minister, to be his emissaries, ambassadors, his apostles, without his physical presence. And so the way that you do that is, first of all, they watch Jesus do his ministry. And next, they do the ministry with Jesus. And now they're at that third phase where they go out and Jesus watches them. And the final phase is where they do it without his physical presence. And so Jesus is in that third phase of their training where he's sending them and he's watching them. He had already sent the 12 out many times, and now he's sending out this 70 or 72. And he says, now the Lord chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he had himself planned to visit. I'm coming there. You go ahead of me. Tell them I'm coming and give them a taste of the kingdom before I get there. I'll be the cleanup batter. I'll be the one that comes in after you. He says, these were his instructions to them. His instructions were instructions about harvest. In In a normal field, there would be like one field and everything grows together and it's ready for harvest all at the same time. But in the kingdom of God, you may be in a field of people And one person's ready for spiritual harvest, and the person next to them, it hasn't even sprouted yet. And the person next to them is in the process of growing some fruit. And the person next to them has passed time, and things are kind of rotten for them. Jesus is saying, I'm sending you out into this harvest field. Learn to recognize the harvest, and much more than that. Uh, Don't think that it's going to be hard to find the harvest. Uh, The truth is, it's going to be hard to find people who are willing to be harvesters with you. The beauty of the gospel is those who receive Christ that are found people immediately become people who want to find people. The workers for the harvest come from the harvest. It's always been that way in the church of Jesus Christ. That someone who's found becomes someone who wants to be someone who finds the others. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the one who's in charge of the harvest, the Lord of the harvest, and ask him to send more workers into his field. What he's saying is that I have prayed for you and you are the ones who are being sent. You pray as you go that God will send help with you. There's 72, but there's only one with you. 
Now go and remember that I'm sending you as lambs among wolves. Oh, thanks, Jesus. It's great. <laughs> lambs among wolves. What he's saying is, remember that you're going to have to be desperate because the people are willing to injure you more sometimes than they're willing to be helped by you. I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. You are going to have to remember that I'm the one who protects you. You have to remember that I'm the one who your power comes from me. Don't take any money with you. No money? How many of you like to take when you go away from home, like to take all cash with you? How many of you like to take all, like, just only the credit card with you? How many people like to make any, any traveler's checks people these days? Any traveler's checks people? And some of you take a mixture of all three, you know, just, just in case something's going to happen. <laughs> and so Jesus is saying, okay, number one, I'm sending you out to some bad wolves. And number two, I'm sending you out with no money. Um, and I'm also going to tell you, don't take any extra clothes. I tell you what, for some of us men who like pack at the last minute, we'll be like, "Woo, no packing necessary. Not even an extra pair of sandals. And on the way there, don't get distracted and talk to anybody else. Don't talk to your friends on the way. And then verse 5. Whenever you enter someone's home... This is all the process of them learning that, they're, that the point of their life is that their name is in heaven, their identity is in heaven, their citizenship is in heaven. And it's, it's interesting because in this journey away from our heavenly home, this is how we learn that this place is not our home. Because the more you're here, the more here doesn't make sense. The longer you, longer you encounter people, the more you think, I don't know about these people. The more you try to serve Jesus in ministry, the more you think, like, wow, I have no idea how this works sometimes. <laughs> and in their process, they're learning that they truly belong somewhere else. They don't have to make their name, listen to this, they don't have to make their name here. Because their name is already made there. It doesn't matter what someone thinks of you here. Because it's Jesus Christ and the hosts of heaven. And all those believers who have gone before you. As the book of Hebrews says. We have a great cloud of witnesses watching. Like in an arena. And so if you displease someone here. If you do it wrong here. It's just a dress rehearsal for there. And say, when you enter somebody's house, say, may God's peace rest on this home. What he means is, when you go in to a new situation, a new person, a new, this is the start of school this year, many people are starting jobs this year, um, you're going to have a new, new relationships all the time, and when you enter into somebody's world, if you're bringing with you intentionality inside of your heart and your soul. I'm bringing love to you. I'm bringing peace with you to you. I'm bringing God's will and God's word to you. I am a representative. I'm an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven. I don't really actually live here. I actually live there. I'm just kind of on this about 70 or 80 year journey here, and I'm going to actually go live there forever. I'm not as concerned about what happens to me here. I'm really concerned about what's going on there. And if you bring that with you into this world, and if your peace, it comes from God, and if someone receives you and thinks like, wow, I'm going to, like, I'm going to, you got something going on that I want. And if some, you ever notice that sometimes people resist your attitude? You come in with all your Jesus on, you know, you come in with all your love on, you come in with all your peace on, and somebody cusses you out. And you're related to them. <laughs> Amen? Or oh me, right? You come in with all that stuff on and you're so upset. Because like, I treated them like Jesus would. 
And I was a good boy. I used to treat them so bad that they should recognize that I treat them so good now. You ever notice that? Like, like I, I'm just here to tell them about Jesus. And the more syllables you put in the name of Jesus, the more, you know, holy you are if you knew that, you know. You know, Jesus, you know, so. The, and you ever notice that people resist your attitude? They resist your spirit. One year I was preaching on this passage, and um, because I have um, a teenager at that time, and then because I was involved in teenager stuff, and because I listened to the radio, um, we, uh, you know, there was that year that Taylor Swift's song, Shake It Off, came out. And so my daughter laughed at me so hard when I preached this passage and called the name of the sermon, Shake It Off. Because look, look at what, look what was here. It says, I send you out as lives among wolves. Don't take any money. Don't take a pair of sandals. Don't greet anybody on the way. And whenever you enter in somebody's home, say, may God's peace rest on this home. And all who live there are peaceful. And if the blessing will stand on them and their heart resonates with your heart and their feelings resonate with your feelings. They want to know about me, Jesus. And they want to know about the healing and the love and the blessing of the Savior. And they want to know how to live righteously. And they want to know about uh, how to be a part of the team. They want to be on the team. They want to be like number 73 on the team. They want to be number 74 or 5 on the team. They want to do that, then everything is good. And he says, stay in that place. As long as they like you, stay there. (laughs) Because they might not like you in the next house. As long as, as there's love there, as long as they're welcoming you, stay there. Because God often works through open doors and open windows. And so, it says, when they welcome you, eat what's set before you. This is a big thing on mission trips. You know, they're going to put some long, you know, set of snails on the, tri- on the mission trip. You know, when you go to some, some community, you know, and you can't, like, not eat their food. You know, you're thinking, like, where has this, like, what is, why is the head still on this fish? You know, <laughs> you know, you think, like, why is there an eel on my plate? I don't know about that. Is this, a, is this a whole alligator? Why are they serving me a baby alligator? And, like, you know, when, when like, that's their very best. I mean, they're giving, like, the very, very, very best. Eat whatever is set before you. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is now come near you. But if a town refuses to welcome you, we're talking about towns. They're sent into little towns of 100. I've been there in northern Israel around this area, and there was like little towns of Bethsaida, Corazon, all these little towns. And it was literally like, you know, population 502, that type of thing. I'm sending you these little towns. And so if a house welcomes you, and then their neighbors welcome you, and then their neighbors welcome you, that's how the gospel is supposed to spread. And so he's saying to them, but if the town welcomes you, great. But if, in verse 10, if they refuse to welcome you, go out to its streets and say, go out in the middle of the street and say, hey, everybody. Hey, everybody who doesn't like me. Everybody who doesn't like the message of Jesus. Everyone who threatens who I am and my identity and all those things. You don't say that, but that's what you mean. We wipe even the dust of your town from our feet. That's my sermon, Shake It Off, came from. The band didn't neglect to play the song that day. The worship team was not down, was playing some Shake It Off. <laughs> if you might not know the song, Shake It Off. Do you know the song, Shake It Off, Bill? Then, yeah. You do? Can you sing it? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Miss Bobby, do you know the song Shake It Off? Uh, Who volunteers to show Miss Bobby the song Shake It Off after church today? And Bill. Miss Bobby, Bill, anybody? Anybody? No volunteers here? Okay, good. Good, good, good. And show them how to do the dance, too. Um, And so, wipe even the dust of your feet off to show them we don't even want your dirt. You could do a, I could do a whole other message here for Christians called 
called boundaries. Whole other message about boundaries here. He said, you don't have to keep on putting yourself in front of people um, to be harmed by them. Wipe even the dust of your feet and show that we have abandoned you to your fate. And know this, the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is near. And then here's this passage. Here's the context of everything. We come back into this thing where Jesus says, great, you did a good job. I mean, can you imagine what their ministry looked like to Jesus? I mean, Jesus, you know, raising Lazarus from the dead and Jesus, the sinless son of God. And he's come, it's, it's as if Jesus is saying, you scared off the little chihuahua dog. You fought a battle against a grasshopper. You know. You chased the roach out of the bathroom. But Jesus praises them and lifts them up and says, you had a great start. But there are bigger grasshoppers. There are tougher days coming. And he's saying, I want to encourage you. Do not take your value, your self-worth, in your identity from your successes. Don't take your value, your self-worth, your identity, how you feel about yourself and how you feel about your life from who accepts you. It's great that you're successful. I set you up for success. I put, you to, I put the right 72 together, and I paired you up in pairs, and I sent you to the towns that I sent you to. How much was done for them? All of it. But he's saying, there's a whole world out there. See, they didn't even know at that time that America, this land mass even existed. Those disciples didn't know. Didn't know about aboriginal tribes. They didn't know about uh, cannibals in the Amazon. Recently, in the border area um, in Mexico, um, a new thing had ha- a new thing had happened. Some of the criminal cr- criminal tribes, criminal tribes, tri- criminal gangs, um, began t- has begun to target the Catholic priest and the Protestant pastors. And uh, a pastor in the last several weeks uh, was preaching his sermon on Sunday morning. And a member of a drug gang that felt threatened by that church's ministry came in during the sermon and shot the pastor to death in the pulpit while he was preaching. See, Jesus knew that there would be days where it just didn't look like following Jesus led to success. He knew there would be days where doing the right thing did not seem to bring the right result. He knew there would be days when you would give it absolutely, completely your all. And it wouldn't turn out like you thought. And he wanted to set them up for this, and he wants to set you up for this. Because that is when you are, the thought comes into your mind like this. I might as well not even go to church. I might as well not even Read my Bible. I might as well not even try to serve God in a ministry. I might as well not even go to this Bible study or home team tonight. Because I'm not getting anything out of it. Is anybody with me there so far? Anybody can, anybody can feel me today? 
if this happened on my job and I'm serving Jesus and going to church, if this happened in my family, we'll tend to try to just shake Jesus off instead of trying to shake the world off. And I don't, I don't want you to sit here today with your sweet Christian smile and not know that there will be days when it does not seem successful. And those are the days you are going to want to say, I'm not doing it anymore. Because the moments that you say, I'm not doing it anymore, is because you have not done what Jesus in advance told you to do. He said, do not rejoice in things that are happening, good or bad, in your family or in the world. I mean, you can take, you know, those those things are going to affect you with joy or sadness. But don't make decisions about who you are based on what other people do or what other people don't do do he knew that that would be a tremendous danger to his followers over the years I've watched many people whose whose spouse is either in church or not in church and and seen how difficult it is them to come and serve Jesus week after week I've seen many times somebody who is at the pinnacle of their career, and they get demoted or treated badly, especially for men. Can we, can, we just, can we get with it, men? We tend to take a lot of our identities from our work. Women tend to take a lot of their identity from their relationships in their home. It's just the natural inclination of the male and female image of God. I mean, we tend to take a lot of our identity from what we can do and what we get paid for and what we get recognized for having done, especially in our employment. And I've seen over the years when a man takes a hit in his area of employment, he has to sit and think to himself so deeply like in the movie Overcomer and how he lost his basketball team. A man has to sit there and think to himself, am I going to give up right now or not? There's been many men who have been, who've lost their jobs and have been so embarrassed and so upset and so internally hiding it that they still get up in the morning and go to work so that their family won't know. And I've heard so many times from families who say this, I could never invite anybody over to my house, the woman would say, because my house isn't the way it should look. And Jesus is saying, in all those things, yeah, you're going to feel attached to these things. But there's something so much more. You are a traveler here. You are, this is your temporary assignment. So you can be upset about it. But can you be upset about it at the level that it's TDY? It's temporary duty? Can you be upset about it that it's, even if it's family, it's temporary with these family members? It's temporary with this job? And if these things impact me at the core level of my identity, I've got to ask that question like he asked the coach in the movie. What are you allowing to define you? What are you letting define you? Because the thing you let define you, the let you let define you, is the thing that you let control you. The thing that you let, the thing that impacts you the most is the thing that defines you. And the thing that defines you is the thing that controls you. Now, doesn't that hit Christianity in the face? 
There's another parable where Jesus says, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord. Like, you know, boss, boss, controller, controller. One I'm submitted to. And he'll say, I never knew you. Because you let other things control you instead of me control you. Because I'm under Christ's control. Then it's Christ's victory. Or it's Christ's defeat or sufferings. It's Christ's family. You know, you can sit. One pastor taught me years ago to say this. When there's trouble at church, he said, Oh, Jesus, you sure do have some problems in your church. Oh, Jesus, what are you going to do about this, Jesus, in your church? Man, you really, and Jesus, you really ought to do something about this person in your church. But, man, what are you going to do about it? And he finishes out, the Bible finishes out the story. And he says, you need to believe what I'm telling you. That's when it says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning, I don't know if that means that Jesus could see in the spiritual world and demons were like falling down and he was shooting them out of the sky like Star Wars. I don't know exactly what that means. But I know for us, the impact enough is of this, is that Satan is afraid and defeated by a man or woman who knows who they are. There is not a human being in this world that can threaten you if you know who you are. And knowing who you are is the same thing as knowing whose you are. Satan's afraid and defeated when you know that your name is not controlled here. Your identity is not controlled here. I saw Satan falling like lightning. He says, look, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy. What he's saying is this. You have authority over the evil and enemies of this world. If you're submitted to my authority and you allow my identity to be your identity. You have authority when I have authority over you. You have authority because when you realize your identity and my, my authority as a believer, my authority as a man of God or your authority as a woman of God or a man of God is completely linked to knowing who I am. Because if I show up and say, I am the CEO's son, I am the boss man's daughter in the company. then the demon employees have to bow down to your authority as a blood son or daughter of the owner. And there's no undercover CEO. There's no undercover boss in this business. And people in this world... We have to be willing to be able to say this. You're going to love or hate me as much as you love or hate Jesus. You're going to like to be around me as much as you would like to be around the identity of Jesus. He says, I've sent you out among people who are snakes. You know any of those? I've sent you out among people who sting like scorpions. But nothing will injure you because no one can hurt you more than God can heal you. No one can harm you more than God can help you. As if some puny little demon in this world could harm someone who knows that they are a citizen and their identity is in heaven. As if. As if a member of the defeated demonic horde could harm someone who is a child, a blood relative, a son or a daughter of the conquering king. 
Nothing will injure you. So don't rejoice because you got a promotion. I mean, you can have a party. You can have a good day. You can have a good, you can be happy. But there'll be a day that you might get a demotion. Don't rejoice because the child obeys and seems to be doing good. Because you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. Don't rejoice because you're loved. Because they might hate you tomorrow. But rejoice because your name is written in the book of life. Um, And what is that book of life as we close today? Revelation uh, chapter 21. It spells it out like this. It says in verse 9. It says one of the seven angels is... To the, to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation. One of the seven angels had come with seven bowls full of the last plagues, came and said, Come, I will show you the bride. The bride, the wife of the Lamb, which is Jesus. The church, who is the bride of Christ. He said, He carried me away in the spirit to a mountain, great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Had a great high wall, 12 gates, and with 12 angels at the gates. And on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. And there were three gates on the east and the west and the north and the south. And the wall had 12 foundations, and every one of them was written a name of the apostles of the Lamb of God. And down in verse 20, it says that it describes the different kind of jewels and sapphires and and topaz and turquoise that were there. And it says out of those 12 gates, every gate was made of one massive pearl. And the great street of the street of the middle of the city was gold, where it talked about the streets of gold as this city. And it says in verse 22, I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. It said, And the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. On no day will its gates ever be shut. There will be no light, no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful. But only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. When he says rejoice... Not in your successes and not in your failures, but rejoice in who you are. It means this, you got to start to find out who you are. Because if you don't know who you are, the evidence of someone who doesn't know who they are is the, it, the evidence that I don't know who I am is when I am taken down by something that happens to me. Or I'm lifted up and inflated in my ego and something else that happens to me. That's evidence that I don't know who I am. I'm a citizen of a different nation with a different identity. And so I operate by a different set of rules. I operate by grace. I operate by forgiveness. I operate by humility. I operate by faith. I operate by risk. I operate by trust. And I do not trust what I see because I know that this is temporary. I trust what my faith inside of me tells me is real. And so, uh, 
I got a call yesterday from Brother Larry here about this radically changed old man in the nursing home, Nancy's father, Mr. Curtis. I got a call that he passed away at one in the morning, and his funeral will be this Tuesday. And uh, we can all come out and support Miss Nancy during that time. But the idea is this. When I was in his room, uh, in his room in the nursing home, I looked up on the shelf and there was this great big family Bible. I was talking to him. I was so distracted by the great big family Bible. And I took it down and inside of it, in the beginning, was like, this belongs to. And it had the name of the original family member who it had, had ever belonged to. And it had, you know, the family tree with the names and all those kind of things. And this huge, beautiful Bible. I don't know how old it was. 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old, something like that. This belongs to. And so for you and me, we are just like that Bible. We're like something that you look at on the shelf and say, this is nice. It's beautiful. A lot of good things here. But when I open it and it's see the person's name there, this belongs to. And the Bible is you and the name is this belongs to Jesus Christ. Bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. A citizen of a different country. A person of infinite value. A person whose life is not controlled by the things that happen to them. A person who takes their joy and their rejoicing and their faith and their love, not from other people, but from Jesus Christ and Him alone. Uh, Knowing that one day they'll live in a city who doesn't even need a sun, but it was lighted because of Jesus Christ. It was lighted because of that. And so I can walk into this world and I can succeed and I can succeed and I can succeed and I can succeed. And I can bear fruit, and I can bear fruit, and I can do good, and I can do good because my life is not dependent on doing good. How great could I do if I knew that my life wasn't dependent upon doing great? I'm not in threat. I don't have to get this right in order to be taken care of. I don't have to know everything in order to be taken care of. I don't have to be the best in order to survive. It's the opposite of this dog-eat-dog crazy world that we live in sometimes. I don't have to be the best. I can come in last. Like Mr. Curtis getting saved very at the end of his life. I can come in last and be counted as first. How much more does that grace of God want to make me get out there and live righteously and love faithfully and love beautifully? How much more? Name in heaven name in heaven NIH name in heaven you gotta stand with me as we close today I want you to today think of some of those great successes you've had in ministry or times when things just went just so right and then think of times you know when the car broke down or the, the truck blew up or the Um, or the money didn't work out and I want you to start a brand new practice today okay brand new practice today and say think about those things and just just sit back especially the ones that are tough and say NIH especially the things that are hard NIH NIH name's in heaven my name's in heaven My name's not on this, it's in heaven. Let's worship God with this song. The band is leading us in.